And now I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Dr. Ani Sasko, who was with the World Health Organization for more than 20 years as Chief of Cancer Prevention, has been with the French NIH for many years, is now with us as a expert advisor to the Science Advisory Board of Environmental Health Trust. Dr. Sasko. Thank you. Thank you, Devra. Thank you for inviting me here. It's a big honor to be able to talk to you tonight. And I'm going to share with you my experience of the IRC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is a specialized agency of the World Health Organization and the monograph they issued on cell phone radiation and other wireless radiation. So as I said, it's not a small agency which is doing this thing, because in the IRC you have at least around 15 countries represented, and when work is being done, the objective is really to study cancer with an aim at prevention. So it's really to try to prevent further cancer. We are not dealing, almost not at all, with treatment. That's really aimed at prevention. So the way we are working when we are doing what we call these monographs is to have experts from all countries in the world getting together and working with the IRC staff, which is called the Secretariat. People are working for one year, more or less, to prepare draft documents, and then they meet for 10 days in Lyon, in France, to finalize that work and come to a conclusion. They are working in subgroups, the one dealing with the exposure, to know how to measure exposure, and for cell phone we know it's not an easy issue. Then the ones dealing with studies in human, the epidemiology, which is really the study of human population, the ones dealing with animal experiments, as Devra presented, and what we call other relevant data, which is looking at mechanism of action, genotoxicity, interactions, more defined questions. When people work apart, then they later on get together for plenary discussion. And therefore, all specialists are to agree on common things. So it's not each remaining in this little corner. Everyone is working together. And finally, coming up with an evaluation. So the way they work is that each group does a summary of its work, exposure, human data, carcinogenicity, other data, and then they will combine all this summary to classify the product along five groups, in fact, which uh, represent various levels of evidence of certainty of the characteristic action of cancer. The group one are the compounds for which we are fully sure, everyone agrees, most studies agree, that they are carcinogenic to humans. That's why you find things like tobacco, asbestos. Group 2A, probably carcinogenic to humans. We have data in human population but somewhat less data, or maybe because the exposure is more recent. And in animals, by contrast, things are quite settled. It's clear the product is a carcinogen. 2B is possibly carcinogenic to humans. So there we have, again, less data or less concordant data, including also in, in animals. So we are not so sure. Then there are two other categories, which I think needs to be uh, looked at, especially the group three, because if you go to the IRC website, you can find all compounds by alphabetical orders. So if you are interested in something, you can look it up and see how it has been classified. The group three is often presented by people as saying there's no effect. That's not the case. I always insist on that. Group three means that for the time being, we don't have enough data to classify. So it's not classifiable, which is not the same thing when saying there's no risk. 
Group 4 is hardly ever used as one compound for things which are demonstrated not to be carcinogenic, which doesn't mean that there are no non-carcinogenic substances in the world, but of course, if they are not suspected, we don't go through all this evaluation process. So to come to the topic of interest today, it's in 2011 that the IRC classified cell phones and other EMF emitting uh, uh, machinery of various kinds, wireless radiation, Wi-Fi, all kinds of connected, um, so-called connected objects, as possibly carcinogenic. So as you see, it's not the highest level. It was not at that time. And a lot of the evidence from the human side came from two studies. One, the interphone study, which was conducted in 13 different countries, starting in the late 1990s, and uh, with results which ended up being published in 2010. So it took a long time to do it. And this study showed that the increased risk of brain tumors was seen in the heaviest users. But at that time, these were people who had only been exposed to 1,630 hours, which is not much in a lifetime. But of course, these people were the first users of cell phones. So this, in that group, we were seeing an increased risk. What's more, the risk was higher for tumors on the side of the head on which people were usually holding their phone and on the temporal lobe, which is the part most heavily exposed when you are using your phone. So in fact, this result was exactly what could be expected when you start with a new product, cell phones after all are not that old, when you are going to see a risk, you will see it first among the ones heavily exposed. So it's not a role of chance, it's exactly what we were expecting. Similar results were obtained by a group of Swedish studies, mostly done by Ardell, where he also found that risk was increased for the heavy users. But he looked at something that no one else looked uh, at this time, which was that the risk was higher for the people who started using wireless phones before the age of 20. And now, as you know, you have kids starting at age seven. So that's very worrisome again. So this means, in fact, that although overall, if you say no use of a cell phone versus ever use, of course, you don't find any difference. But if you look at the ones who were at that time using cell phones a lot, that's where you see the effect. And again, that makes sense. I mean, it's common sense after all. It's not big science. It's exactly what was expected. And Dr. Miller will tell you more about further analysis. So that was the official classification, a group 2B. When I was discussing these results with my kids, he said, you know, 2A, 2B, possible, probable, who cares? I mean, what are you worrying about? After all, you'd be happy if there's somewhat written carcinogen. It makes a huge difference from a regulatory point of view. Because in some of the American states, as well as in some countries in the world, there is an automatic mechanism leading to the fact that if a product is classified as group one, but also as 2A, then governments or various regulatory agencies need to do something. It has to be considered as a carcinogen, therefore with possible compensation in case of occupational exposure, and need for warnings and regulation. So it makes a big difference. For 2B, usually it's still ignore. So that's why we have been kept on working to get it to, um, to 2A, and that's what Dr. Miller is going to say. But even before that meeting, for years before, there were discussions in some parts of the countries, and the IRC is located in Lyon. So just before Christmas, we were very pleased to see this type of ads in the uh, city, where you have two, two kids uh, using uh, teens as a cell phone, 
and where it's saying that cell phone for under 14, no. So it was telling people that for a Christmas gift, they should get maybe something else. So that means that despite a low classification which was to come later, I think it's important for the ones who have enough data, evidence, and conviction to defend it and talk to people as well as talk to politicians, because after all, they are the ones passing the laws and they are the ones who can do something for helping us having a safer population, not only for ourselves, but especially for the young ones who now start using a cell phone or a pad at three months of age. So the future may be quite dark if we don't react. But I will let uh, Dr. Miller continue for the newer studies. <laughs>